So I'm going to just introduce you to this idea of God as a time traveller. God as a time traveller. We have grown up, many of you, all of you probably have grown up with this idea of time travel, something that is, is it fascinates the mind. And there are different people, different generations that can probably recall different films that represent this whole idea of time travel. Now, for my generation, <coughs> there is a film called Time Cop, which features or, or stars uh, a gentleman called Jean Claude Van Damme. It's a 1994 film, and so for my generation, that's very much uh, 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 one of the key time travel type films. But there are previous ones, there are films I grew up with that go back maybe even to the 1950s, I remember watching. I think there's one famous one that might be a 1950s or 1960s film that deals with time travel. And I can picture a certain actor, a famous actor that some of you remember, and a big chair that he would sit in, big kind of device that he would sit in for time travel purposes. Uh, Hollywood star back in the day, I can't remember his name, might be Rod something, something rather like that. But it's quite a famous uh, film for, for if you're of a certain generation, or if you can go back on me, and you know, I'm a bit of a film buff, so I do go back in time to films of the past. Uh, I like to record those. But this idea of God is a time traveller. So God travels time, and yet he is outside of time. This is one of the great qualities that God has. Now, the problem with that is, is for us as Christians who are bound as human beings, physical human beings, that are bound by time, and harassed by time, and, and, and just time is constantly on our case, God doesn't often operate the way we think he should. Because we're thinking about time, and, or there's, there's not enough time, or, or it needs to happen quicker, or come on. Well, that's too late. Well, that was too soon, or wasn't quite early. It's all to do with time. But because God is outside of time, he doesn't operate that way, and so therefore we can get a bit irritated with him, can't we? Let's, let's be honest, or maybe it's just me. Maybe it's just me. Okay. Well, if only you'd done that properly, or only you'd done that just in time, or, or quick enough, or, then everything would have been fine. And we have a story that we could delve into, but for time we, we won't do that this time. We'll have to talk about that another time, actually. But this idea that God travels time, and yet he's outside of it, it defies logic, doesn't it? We deal with time and constants, we deal with start, beginning, end, past, future, present. These are all time descriptions. And yet, God has this ability to be there, I believe, before, at the same time, present, but also he is also ahead. And so when there is an issue, when there is a challenge in life for us, God is before that issue, before that challenge. He knew the challenge was coming, even though he didn't. Even though it was a surprise to you, and you thought, what on earth am I going to do? It wasn't a surprise to God. And sometimes that's something else that we need to come to terms with. That we're shocked, and we're like, whoa, what is going on? And God's like, yeah, okay, yeah, I knew that's coming. Just come to me and we'll work this out together. I'll, I'll carry you through this. We'll work this through together. She has the ability to be before an issue, uh, inside the issue, inside the challenge, but also the other side of it. God is also the other side of the challenge that you're in right now. The problem you're in right now, God is the other side of it already. Because he is outside of time, because he operates outside of time, he can be before the issue, and he can be in the issue, in the challenge, but he can also be the other end of it, seeing the resolution. God sees it before you do. And your journey of faith, often my journey of faith, is about how well will we journey with God to get to that point where we're after the issue, after the challenge, but actually we're strong enough to work through and, and we stay with God and stick with God to the point where we see the other end. Because what God's waiting there saying, if you just keep coming, just keep going, you'll get there. I'm the other side, just push through, just stand on me, hold, hold, hold fast, I'm there. How do we know that God is able to time travel yet yeah, he's outside? How do we know that? Where's the evidence for that? Well, let me just quote one really obvious scripture for you if you know your Bibles. If not, then this hopefully will become a new favour of yours. Revelation 1, verse 8. Last book in the Bible. Heavy stuff. I wouldn't recommend it to the first book you read if you're, if you're you know, on a journey of faith. But it is a good book to read. There's lots in there, but there's one particular verse, two particular verses actually, that refer to the nature of God. And God talks about himself in this way. He says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is, and who was, and who is to come, the Almighty. Love when God does that, when he describes himself. 
You know, people talk about themselves in the first person. It sounds a bit, you know, it sounds a bit, really? But when God does it, it's fully justified. He's fully, the, the only person that can do that without any irony or any comedy factor is just, I am who I am. I am God. And I am the Alpha and the Omega. I am who was, or so who is, and who was, and who is to come. Past, present, future. This is the God that we're talking about, this time travel of God. He is past, present, and future. He travels between all of those things at the same time. How can he do that? Because he's God. We need to understand this. Sorry. What is this? We have a slight. Is that the call to say? I will speak down a little bit. Maybe it's me too close to the speakers and give this away. If I speak up louder, is that better? Okay, I'll speak up a little bit for now, just so that we, and then when we are resolved the issue, we will come back to Okay, so, the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end.
But understanding that he's not quite on the same agenda we think he is as us. Because he's not going our time in the same way. So he will come through for us according to his time. Because he is sovereign. And he knows more than we know. So the Alpha and the Omega. Descriptions for God. If you need to know any, you came away with anything today, understand this that he is the beginning and the end. And carry that with you. Genesis 1. We see an example of God at the beginning. So I'm getting God being the first. God at the beginning says, In the beginning, Genesis 1, verse, verse 2 verses, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God, of God hovered over the waters. So there is. God, right there at the beginning of creation. This, this pregnant kind of pause that you see is described here. Now the earth was formless and empty, darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God hovered over the waters. I love that description. What was he waiting for? What was, what was that? It was that spark of creation of genius to begin, that he will begin, that he will start, God will start, because he is the beginning. Yes. Yeah. So there is a need, I believe, that God, I believe that God hovers over our lives, over our situations, over our challenges, to do something. And he's just there, pausing, ready. And we can allow him to do something, or we can leave him just paused. Leave him just paused. In my house, this idea of pause has become quite significant, quite necessary. And if for any of you who have children of a certain age, you'll realise this idea of pause is quite important. Why? Because I'm talking about pausing on certain things like devices, screens. Pause that, please, because we need to do this now. In fact, my son has a shirt that says, I paused my game for this. And it takes it out sometimes when we're going out for the day, and I'm looking at it and I think, yeah, that's very true. But in order to go out for the day, you have to pause again. Or, or pause something he's watching. This is a constant reality for us as parents, to, to pause. But what comes after the pause is a continuation with God. What comes after the pause is action to move on our behalf. So he is described here in the beginning of, of creation as hovering over the water, ready to do something. And then it talks about what he does. And it's magnificent. It's amazing. In the same way in your life, there is a moment where God is hovering over your situation, over your issue, over your challenge that you're thinking about, that you're facing, that you're harassed by, and he's ready to do something. He's ready to move on your behalf. But because he's outside of time, he may not do it the way you think he's going to do it, in the time that you think he should do it. But he will do it. He will do it. He will come through. So there is an imperative for us to position ourselves with God so that we can work out his purposes in our lives. There's an imperative for us to do that because the Bible tells us he, is, he has positioned himself in that way. He positioned himself at the beginning of creation to do that. And in the same way in our lives, he's doing that for us. So we have to position ourselves and position him. Correct? Psalm 16, verse 8. The Lord is my chosen portion and my cup, says the psalmist. You have made my lot secure. The lines of my boundary have fallen in pleasant places. Surely my inheritance is delightful. Verse 7, Psalm 16. I will bless the Lord who counsels me. Even at night my conscience instructs me. Here's the key verse, verse 8. We think about this idea of how God is positioned and how we should position him. Verse 8, Psalm 16. I have set the Lord always before me. Because he is at my right hand, I will not be shaken. Therefore my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body will always dwell securely, for you will not abandon my soul to shield. Nor will you let your Holy One see decay. You have made known to me the path of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence with eternal pleasures at your right hand. Ah, yes. And I'll just continue reading here after verse 8. Verse 8 is a key verse, but I'll just continue reading because it's just such a brilliant song. And you can continue reading on if you like for yourself. Read that Psalm 16. Brilliant. Verse 8. I have set the Lord always before me, because he is in my right hand, and I will not be shaken. I have set the Lord always before me. God who is ahead, ahead of us. If we position God before our issue, before we go into something, before, then God can work on our behalf, before we even get to something, before we even get to a challenge. God can be there. 
The psalmist says he, he does that deliberately. He sets the Lord always before him in front. Acts 2, verse 25. David says this. King David says, he's quoting him in Acts 2. He's quoting him. King David's quote. So David said about him, the Lord that is, I saw the Lord always before me, but because he is at my right hand, I will not be shaken. Reference in there against David wrote many of the Psalms. And so in Acts here we see his, his words, David's words repeated. I saw the Lord always before me, because he is at my right hand, I will not be shaken. Colossians 1, verses 15 to 18, for in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth. Visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. Verse 17. Are you getting, are you getting the trend here? Are you getting the point here? For he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. You getting it yet? Are you guessing it? Before him, he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. So the nature of God is eternal God. That's time travel. As, as God who was, who is, and is to come. Is, is the same God who is before all things, and in him all things hold together. Woo. This is the God we know. This is the God we know. This is the God that you're doing life with, hopefully. This God who time travels, who is before all things. But actually, the psalmist and David here in particular says, I have set the Lord always before me. So Colossians declares he is before all things. But there is still an imperative for us, actually, even though God, that is who God is. We have to position God as that in our life. Because we can keep God on the outside. We can say, well, I know you're before all things, God. I know you all think in, in you all things hold together, but I need to hold everything together. I'll do it. I, if I hold everything together, then, then it'll be good. I can trust myself. I'm not sure about you, God. <laughs> and yet, if you think about who God is, we should give him all trust. But we don't always do it. Let's be honest. We don't know this. So, God is represented here as being before, in front of, in other words. In the sight of. So, if He's in front, you see Him. When we are in our challenges, in our issues, in our problems, do we see God before us? Or do we see the problem? Let's be honest, often we see the problem, don't we? But what God wants us to do is to put Him in front of that problem. So, it's us. It's him. Problem's there. What do we see first? Who do we see first? God. He is before, before all things. Before all things. So, he is there, the problem is there. He is there, the problem is there. And the next problem is there, but he is there. Constant. Leading us through. Shielding us. In the sight of him. Here's the point. If he is before us, it means we have to follow him. Not that he follows us. Often the way we operate is that we say, okay, well, I'm doing this, could you just help me out with this? And we, we want God to tag along. Because I don't know, I need to be before. You follow me. Follow my way, follow my instruction. I'll carry you through. I'll instruct you. I will give you the way forward. God cannot guide you if he's behind you. Because he's got a can, of course he can. But understand the principle and analogy I'm making. He wants to be before you, in front of you, to walk you forward, to direct you forward, to drive out things in front of you. If he's in front of you, he can do that. It's like the battering ram, or like the, 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 the you know you get those guards on, on different vehicles, the snow plow, it's got a guard on it, and it goes before and it plows away. God wants to be that for you. That he moves, it says he makes the crooked path straight. What the word talks about. He makes the he brings the hills down and makes them flat. He talks about that. Understand this. God wants to do that. He wants to go before, before you, in order to make room, make a way. God doesn't want to be behind, behind your decisions, behind your agenda, behind your life. God doesn't want to be there. In order to guide you, he needs to be in front, before. I have set the Lord always before me. I have set the Lord always before me. But this takes practice. It takes practice and it takes determination to do this. But we have to agree with who God is first. We have to agree in our hearts, yes, that's you, God. I know that's you, therefore, you are worth following. You are worth putting before you. The psalmist understood that. 
He understood who God was. He understood that God was helping your neighbor as he described himself. God understood. He, this psalmist understood that. Let me see that. He is helping your neighbor that you are beginning and the end. Therefore, I will follow you. Because I know you were already there before I got into this problem. And I know you will be at the end. The other side of the problem. Because you will carry me through. So as we begin to land here, I just want us to just conclude with a couple of thoughts here. Let us continue to press into God. Let me encourage you, and I encourage myself. Continue to press into God. Press into Him. Pursue the way forward, because He is before you. And so if you pursue God, you're pursuing the way forward, because God knows the way forward. So for some of you, maybe today you think, I don't have a clue what I'm doing. I have no idea what I'm doing in life. I don't get it. I don't have a sense of direction. If you don't, follow him. Set the Lord always before you. If you set him before you, he knows the direction. He knows the way forward. Just put him in front. That's it. For some of you, that's all you need to do. For some of you, God has already given you a plan, a way forward, and he wants you to stay the course. He wants you to stay focused on that. Said, stay, keep me in front of you, he's saying, and, and I will lead you through. I have a plan, I have a vision, I have a way forward for you. Don't sway from that. But for others of you, it's, you just need to put God first. Just put God in front. Just look, both God, God. Paul the Apostle spoke about this. He said, I, I resolved that I would preach nothing but Christ crucified while I was with you. In the New Testament. In other words, he was just focused and driven to say, it's Christ. It's Christ. Don't talk to me about anything else. Just Jesus. 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 What was that you talked about? What other name? No, no, no. Jesus. Jesus. Focus. For God wants for us. Galatians 6, verse 9. Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest. If we do not, give up. I have set the Lord always before me. If we do not give up, let us, be, do, let us not become weary in doing good, for, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Some of you need to hear that today. You think maybe the consistency isn't enough and it's not working because nothing's happening yet. God says, no, continue stepping forward. Keep putting me before you. I will come through for you. You will break through. There will be answers for you. I will open doors. I will put down barriers. I will make breakthroughs for you. I will heal. I will overcome. But just stay the course. There's two expressions here in that scripture in uh, Galatians 6. At the right time and at the proper time. Two ways to do it. At the right time and at the proper time. You will reap the harvest. God's time, not ours. At the right time, at the proper time. It's God's time, not ours. So because he is outside of time, he can do that. He can do it in his proper time. And finally, just with this, let me leave you with this, this will be that. Romans 5, verse 8. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. God's timing. It says, God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While, he didn't say clean yourself up, sort yourself out, then come to me. I'm going to let you tell your secret. I, I, I'm a bit of a, a germaphobe, which really isn't very consistent with having children, as I'm sure you know. And I have to have three of them. Why have I done that? Now, I, I have an issue that means that when my youngest in particular comes to me and with her hands, maybe in a certain condition or a face in a certain condition, she wants a hug. There's part of me that, that, that has a second thought about that. Thinks, oh, do I want to, you know, and face is crying, so, oh, I want you to hug me, I want to hug me. I've, I've, I've put this nice shirt on, look at the And I have to forego that and just pick her up and just like, okay, you're going to put your hands on there, you're going to put your place on me. It's not good. Children are good to kind of erode some of your issues that you might have around, you know, maybe OCD and things like that. They just they don't care about any of that. Is. God operates the same way. It says, while we were still in a mess, while we were still messy and sticky and, and mucky and kind of in the grime, he saved us. He says that he, <laughs> he died for us. God's timing. 
It wasn't a case of, oh, God knew the timing was, I need to move now, and you can come to me now. That was God's timing in the kingdom. He said, no, no, you, need to, you can come to me now. As you are, a mess, come to me. Even now, for some of you, you become a mess. And God said, and God's saying, no, no, come to me now. The time is now. The kingdom, the, the, my timing is now for you to come to me, even as a mess. Just come. And we will sort it out. And I will clean you up. I'm just going to pray. I'm going to pray in a moment. Um, maybe for many of us, you might have been concerned with the past. The past carries with you. And you can't leave you alone. It's like a nuisance on your leg. It's just like, you look around and think it's there still. Why is it still there? But God has a new comfort for you. A new future for you. Because he is always before you. Because he is always before you. He has good things for you, ahead of you. And what he says to you is you won't find the good things he has for you in the past. So if God is behind you, and you're looking, you're looking for him there, he's not there. He's not in your past. He's not in the stuff, the, the mess that you were in, all the things. He's not in that. He's in the new future that he has for you. He's already there saying, come, let's go. Come, come on. You won't find him in your past, in your history, you'll only find him in your future, ready to lead you on. Isaiah 43, verse 18. Forget the former things, see I am doing a new thing. Do you not perceive it? There's a whole context for that, but it still speaks of the heart of God. I believe there is a principle there, the heart of God, is to forget the former things. The whole story of salvation is about forget the former things, the sin, the mess that you're in. Forget that, I have forgotten that. It's, it even says that he blocks out your sins, he blocks them out, like you blot out, you grab out some kind of piece of paper, or rubs it out like it was never there. Because of who he is, not because of us. So be confident today. If you came today burdened, if you came today distracted, harassed, that your God is outside of time, and even though the timing may not seem like your timing, his timing is perfect. His timing is perfect because while we were still sinners, remember, he died for us. So his timing was perfect. He knew when and how to do what needed to be done. And he still knows now what needs to be done and when it needs to be done. He knows. So our job is to set him always before us. My job, your job, is to set him always before us. So that he can do what he does best. So I'm going to switch, unfortunately I've got the, the microphone here. I'm going to just sing a song to you and I'm just going to believe God maybe wants to speak to you through it. And hopefully you'll be blessed by it. And it's, the, it's called Jesus I Need You. If some of you may know it, you may not. It's by Hillsong. And it's some of the words says here. Remember love, remember mercy. Christ before me, Christ behind me. Your loving kindness has never failed me. Christ before me, Christ behind me. Now I said about, oh, God doesn't want to be behind you, but this, this image here is about God surrounding us, before and behind. Christ before me, Christ behind me. So I'm going to sing this, this song, and hopefully you, God can speak to you through it. You can consider what... Consider what He wants to do. And how he wants to do it. And not the when, because he knows the when. He knows the when. I think the words will be available, but I just want you to listen. Just for now. To these words.
Surely goodness and mercy will follow us all the days of our life. 